Thank you and welcome everyone to this week's Insignio Speaker Series. I'm happy to be joined today by Art De Gaetano. Art from Bromsville, CIO and founder. How are you today? Doing well, thank you for having us today. Excellent. So uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, the Brahms Hill Fund is um, a position uh, not only within the IMAPS strategies, but it's also um, a position that's highlighted in our investment guidebook. So Art, it's a pleasure to speak to you today, specifically as your portfolio manager in several of our strategies. So good to be here with you today. Terrific. Yes. All right. So let's get started because I'm sure we don't have a lot to talk about, especially in the rate market, right? So <laughs> um, give us a very quick overview. Tell us right now, give us your 30,000 foot view uh, uh, on the rate market, the Fed, monetary policy, U.S. economy, all the goodies that people want to hear about. So I would say that uh, our view is um, very similar to, say, 25 years ago when I was at Bear Stearns, where... On a bad day, the 10-year over the next two, three, four years will trade at 3.5%. In a normal environment, it'll trade between, let's say, 450 and 5. Um, I don't, we do not see significant Fed cuts. We see maybe two that'll be more um, in reaction to a more moderating inflation picture. So uh, Taylor Rule would tell you they should be at 450 right now. And... Uh, you know, when you think about inflation, the pack of bacon that goes from five dollars to eight, it's not going back down to six. It's just going up less fast. So the year over year figures are heading towards two. Um, I don't think the spirit of the market is thinking that way yet. We're also seeing a little bit of a slowdown um, from what we're seeing economically. So um, we're more biased to a range trade. And I would tell you, you know, if you take 09 to 21 out of your brain, and you think about 20 years ago where high yield would trade between 8 and 10%, the 10-year note would trade between 350 and 5%. And at least that's where we think we're going. And Fed funds will start being 200 over inflation where it used to be years ago. So um, yeah, so we're not as constructive as people that are thinking the Fed's going to cut four or five times and the whole curve is going to go to 3%. But uh, we do think it's a great time to be in fixed income because absolute yields have been pretty attractive. So I'm assuming that being being a pretty flexible bond manager yourself, you're you're in other parts of the fixed income market instead of sort of focusing in on the long duration trade based upon what you're telling me. Is that accurate? Correct. Yes, we uh, continue to have a uh, about a third of the portfolio in um, high quality fixed to floating rate preferreds. Um, very interesting. These have seasoned now over the past few years. So all names that you would know, JP Morgan, British Petroleum, very secured uh, type of IG credits. Um, we're not in any of the European versions which have conversion to equity the way Credit Suisse went to zero, um, just so you know. But um, that allocation is very positively convex. And in a rising rate environment, we will get called away in the next eight to 22 months. And um, all those coupons reset and will fix for five years. They'll reset off five-year treasuries, 400 to 550 when they're called. So unfortunately, we're probably getting called away. We're going to annualize about a 785 uh, to a call mm -hmm. on that entire basket. But if you saw a poor, a poor fixed income market, those are going to return positively and have an uncorrelated return. And in a rally, they're all below par and we're going to get this pull to par as well, plus coupons. So um, that's our biggest allocation. Um, we do have an allocation to uh, which I think some of the uh, your team members know last November, December, we bought across 24 investment grade names. Boeing, Oracle, Starbucks. Um, we bought 30 year duration or maturities that were three and a quarter to 4% coupons. So these were issued in 21. They were down approximately 35 points. So we averaged $63 price around 670 yield. And that entire basket, because of the low dollar price, um, was about an eight and a quarter duration. So very interesting. When I think about my own funds in our strategies, if I can buy Oracle bonds 
at mm-hmm. 62 dollar price, close to seven percent. That's pretty attractive. So um, that was an allocation where we did extend duration, but it only took our portfolio up about a year and a quarter. Um, so we're acting in a rally in about about a five twenty five thirty duration, mm-hmm. but in a in a um, rate rise environment. We're only going down by about a two and a quarter duration because those preferreds um, and that low IG doesn't really move as much as you would think, given the maturity spectrum. Yeah. So, our, so let's discuss the the nightmare scenario, the bear case now for 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 not just holders of the fund, but bond holders in general, uh, which is let's say a resurgence of inflation where the Fed has to begin a new. Forget about cutting but potentially begin a new rate hiking cycle. Um, uh, not sure where that is in your sort of a uh, uh, range of cases, but you know maybe we can discuss. And how could a strategy like yours potentially mitigate against that outcome? Sure. So always a possibility. Um, it's I would think it's not probable them sitting where they currently are. We're already starting to see some softness. But let's just say inflation does come up to your suggestion um, and they had to raise rates. I think you'd see a massive steepening in the curve where people would get very concerned. You'd probably see 10 year and long bonds do well. I mean, it doesn't sound like they should with rising inflation, but you'd probably see more of a steeper curve similar to the way you saw in the uh, first or uh, back half of 22. Um, where our portfolio would do well is um, all those preferreds will get called. So mm-hmm. over an eight to 22 month period, we're going to be getting return capital, almost like a mortgage bond returns principal and interest. Um, we have about 16% of the portfolio that will mature within um, a year to year and a half, all investment grade corporate bonds. The long duration allocation I mentioned in those deep discounted IG names, um, that's about a 14% allocation. I'd have to, you'd have to lose over 120 basis points, 115 basis points to net net lose money between the coupon build and where you would be on that uh, duration. So in a rising rate environment, we probably look like a hero um, compared to most bond managers. Um, yet, if you look at the rally in December, in November, December of last year, we've, we outperformed. So this year, the ag right now, as of this morning, was down 135 basis points. I think we're up about 75 basis points on the year. So, you know, again, not, not to say that we're so excited about being up 75, but um, you should consider, think of us as outperforming. I mean, we're going to run between a six and seven coupon, I think, for the next three years. So we're going to compound towards 20% on a coupon alone. Um, so, yeah, I think we would do well in that environment. If, and that's if based rates on current, current holdings in the, in the portfolio. Correct. There's still approximately 18% in short-dated treasuries. So we had about a 42% allocation to one to three, three month treasuries up until last October. Um, that capital was put to work in the fourth quarter of last year, um, all the way down to about 18%. So across the firm, we have uh, probably about a billion, uh, I'd say about a billion three in short term treasuries. I'm not really nervous about that. You know, the two year treasury is at 460. The curve's telling you it's not mm-hmm. going to get away from you. But right. I also would think, you know, this is going to be an interesting year. I, I think it's, a, um, you know, a lot of people, including myself, I mean, you're not really sure the political side, what's going to happen in the US. But we want to keep some capital uh, really in place to take advantage of any opportunities and dislocation. I mean, we're always liquid, which I know your, your team knows. Um, and I don't think I have one. I don't think there's a single name in our portfolio that's defaultable in the sense that ally preferreds are probably the most volatile. And, you know, that's a company Warren Buffett owns 10 percent of the, the company. Um, they just became investment grade last year from double B. But, you know, we're very high up the quality spectrum, not significant credit beta here. Yeah. 
And I'd like to remind everyone that if you do have questions for Art, please submit them into the chat. I'd be happy to read them out to him here in just a few minutes. Um, Art, let, let's let's transition now. And maybe talk about some other uh, fixed income sub asset classes that investors might have an idea about. Would love to hear your views on. Um, let me ask you right off the bat: Are are investors being adequately compensated in the uh, in the high yield market, uh, given where spreads are today? Um. Well, a simple answer would be no. Um, spreads are, you know, on the cash index are about 310. On the credit default market, it's about 325 basis points. Uh, I would say spreads are just from uh, quantitative analysis, technical analysis, and let's say years of plenty of scars on, on me from doing this for over 30 plus years. Spreads are unattractive. Absolute yields have been okay because there's been Mm -hmm. Very few defaults. And mm -hmm. I would say that arena, um, these, a lot of the CFOs of these bigger credits did a great job extending maturities, you know, with post COVID. So they really um, did not have a big refi wall coming up. I think in 2026, you start to see that more. But relative value, our structure products team in Newport Beach. Um, they are buying, you know, 65 LTV three year first lien paper at eight and a half percent roughly. So when you think about high yield index with unsecured triple C risk at 780 on the on the index yield, I think that's very unattractive versus other markets, um, you know, especially compared to structured products. Right, right, right. And, and and tell us perhaps a few more sectors or, or, or sub assets where you feel like they're either compelling or they're not. And, and you think that there's warning signs there. So I think private credit is something that's very over allocated to um, not our core competency. So I don't really want to opine on it, but everyone in their you know sibling has raised a cri private credit fund in the last two, three years. And it seems like those credits, if they were so strong, they would have come to the levered loan market or the high yield market. So, you know, why are they going to um, borrow money at seven, eight percent over mm -hmm. SOFR and give away covenants? So we'll see if any sort of recessionary market hits that area might, uh, you know, see some damage, I think. The um there are if you try to sell some of those in the over the counter market, you know, lock up vehicles, let's say seven year vehicle lock up and now they're three year seasoned. The mm -hmm. bids are, tend to be, you know, 75 to 85 cents on the dollar. We just pay attention to that. So maybe those structures aren't marked properly on a mark to market now, right now. But again, that could be a space that I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, that's about a trillion eight now as you know, it's bigger than the high yield market. Right. Um, so that that's an area, um, you know, aside from that, I mean, we're not seeing significant credit issues. We're seeing more delinquencies at the consumer level. Mm -hmm. The last six, seven weeks in, in our, during our risk meeting every week, you know, we're watching 30, 60, 90 day credit card delinquencies go through the roof. Um, you're seeing auto delinquencies pick up. Uh, bankruptcy filings are where they were um, prior to um, ninety, you know, two thousand and to oh seven. So it's uh, you know it's interesting. I think the consumer hasn't come through yet, but seems like they are definitely starting to uh, weaken here now that there's not COVID support funds that have come in and they're dealing with the you know the higher prices on inflation. Right, At least that's right. our, our our humble view. Yeah, that's actually that's actually interesting that you bring that up because uh, uh, I was looking at some data on this very same topic today, um, and uh, sp specifically on U.S. household interest payments. And you know, mortgage payments uh, or have gone up, obviously, but they haven't gone up nearly as sharply as non-mortgage interest payments. Um, right. And so they're now, even though non-mortgage interest, as you probably know, is a is a very small percentage of of overall consumer debt, I, I think it's around only 10% of all the debt outstanding on U.S. household sheets. It's now, because it's accelerated so much, it's gone up so much, it's now 
equal to mortgage payments in terms of what's costing a, a U, an average U.S. household uh, budget on. So, so that that's something that's definitely not being talked about. How would you mitigate that risk um, in your portfolio? What so what would you do in that case? Because I think that's interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because, like I said, I was just looking at that data today. So, yeah, and you, you know, you're there's a lot of interest payments that you're talking about. You know, everything from credit cards to non autos, mortgage, right? To, Every yeah, non mortgage, mortgage. Yep, and, yep, and yep. that's significant. So, I'd say before I answer the question on how we mitigate it, um, you know, overall, and and we talk about this right because you have to think about the environment, you know, earnings, economy, where rates are. Um, if you were to look at our debt level, you'd be scared to ever invest, right? So you can't look at that debt level and try and you know figure it out on a daily basis, right? But where you're heading between that and between all of the um, Medicare expenses, things like that, our interest is really starting to now become an issue as far as a drag, I think, on what's going to be growth in the economy. We're almost borrowing ahead. And there is about 17 trillion that is going to mature in the next three years. So this is two, three year, four year paper that that was issued five years ago. Average coupon is about one and a quarter. So the new reset as they roll some of this front end is going to only add to that drag. So if you thought about it, you'd say it's going to lead to a slowdown, right? The government is the biggest spender or driver of, of, of the GDP growth. Now go if there's a fiscal conservative that's in place, right? Like we should all, I'm not trying to go on a soapbox here, but we should all probably have term limits here. But let's say you get more of a fiscal conservative thought process. Well, then they're going to cut spending. So I'd say both roads lead to slower growth and slower periods. So combine that with a consumer. And I'm not a grumpy guy where I wake up bearish every morning. No, but I think you to be in fixed income, to be in high quality fixed income, I think it serves a very good purpose here. So, again, if you caught NVIDIA and things like that, terrific. But there's a really good opportunity here to make six, seven, eight percent on products that are not toxic and do that net of fee and do that for a while. And if everything rallies, you're going to put a bigger total return up. But I think for us, it's um, stay invested, but really avoid retail sector. Um, you know, I don't mind the financials. The bigger banks, I feel, are very insulated. You look at those loan books. I mean, it's unbelievable the low default rates that J.P. Morgan, Bank America, City have. And, I, and, and the, the regional banks here we've totally stayed away from in the portfolio. We've done prep work in our bullpen on about 11 names and the fulcrum security are, are like four or five year senior unsecured um, areas. So if you did get CRE issues here and they blow out, I could see us buying some of those um, at a senior unsecured level that'll mature. But um, yeah, otherwise I think the way you mitigate it is through um, good carry, don't take too much credit beta. Um, I don't think you need to be in long duration, right? Depending on where the curve's going to go. But uh, that's how we would mitigate it. Um, you know, and, and again, I, I think that uh, it seems like it's heading that way. I'm not trying to have a crystal ball here, but that's what seems like it is going to be starting to develop here. We're even seeing in the muni market, which we're taking our municipal exposure to zero just because. Why is that? Um, yeah. Yeah, you're seeing uh, California run a $70 billion budget deficit. Uh, New York City is going to be closer to $18 billion. Um, I mean, just I, I don't know where what these cities are going to do. They either have to get a bailout at some point or they have to cut services extremely uh, hard, which will only create more demographics flowing out of these bigger cities. So yeah, I probably sound like I'm very negative. So, I'm not trying to be. Are like, you saying that these cities have to get their fiscal house in order? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're trying to imply? You know, if you're going to give away free health care, um, you, you better figure out where you're getting, you know, getting that, at least that revenue. And it, I, if there's ever a recession, it's going to be really interesting here. Um, so we're not 
again, not trying to be gloomy. We're invested. We have, yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, positions on. But, uh, um, yeah, I think you just have to be paying attention here. Yeah, yeah. Now, listen, as a, as a, as a, as a bond manager, I'm assuming, obviously, you're, 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 what you want to protect is catastrophic loss because that, that's very difficult to come back from as a bond manager. So I'm sure most people will appreciate that. Uh, maybe last question I'll ask you before I turn it to, to some audience questions that have come into me directly here. Um, how do you, as a, as a, as a, let's say multi-asset fixed income manager in the sense that you're looking at many different sectors uh, within the fixed income space generally, you, you, you can in, invest in preferreds, you can invest in, in municipals and in, in credit and spread. So how do you, um, What's your secret sauce to know exactly what allocation to have make, makes sense? Uh, walk us a little bit through your investment process there. Sure. So um, big part of the process is prep work. The way a pro athlete practices six, seven hours a day, we do significant prep work. And if on securities, um, asset classes, and if it doesn't warrant being the portfolio, it goes into what we call a bullpen. Um, so as of this morning, there's about 94 names in the bullpen. But if you're prepared to buy something at a price, even though it's not there in the market, you know, and you have capital, it's the speed of capital to 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 be there, right? So that long IG trade I mentioned, you know, we waited a year on that, and finally it got to north of 650 yield, below 70 dollar price, and then we got in motion. But we were prepared, you know, to the buy. So the prep work is significant. There's Sometimes you also have to be flexible. So four months ago, I'll give you an example. Um, we saw a bid list. And again, we're trading on the same desks that BlackRock, JP, PIMCO, Guggenheim, and we're uh, a, a, like a Navy SEAL team on a bigger ocean, you know, with our capital. Um, so a bid list came in. There was 180 million two-year JP Morgan bonds that we bought at 670 yields. Now, we weren't looking to deploy capital in the two-year part of the curve, but when I looked at it with our team, you know, we're going, that's a 14% return in two years. We win there, right? So it's kind of as, as you're almost a taker of price. You try and get prepped for some areas that you think are good. Um, if there's a recession, there's certain names in our bullpen we're going to buy. You know, there are um, 16 double Bs mm -hmm. that – are two and a half to four year maturities that we've pro forma up that in a recession will probably trade around 8%. And we've already mentally tripped every covenant, shrunk EBITDA, you know, take liquidity to zero. Those all mature. So those will be, you know, a 25 to 30% type of um, return over a maturity spectrum of two and a half to three and a half years. So pretty attractive. So we try and prep four different type of scenarios. If there's a risk off scenario, you know, one thing I'd mentioned, which I think is important and people haven't talked about it in the last five weeks, the correlations are starting to move. So we look at correlations once a week. And if you think about tw in 22, you know, the, your regular stock bond portfolio all went down, right? If there's a equity move or a risk off move, I think you're going to get a decent rally in fixed income in, in treasuries. So that correlation is the old correlation that used to exist is starting to creep back into the market. Every week it's been getting a little more correlated. Um, so that's another way where, um, you know, you, you might prep for um, something is to be in more longer dated um, quality securities. Again, we'll rally a, in a bigger duration way than our current duration spits out. Uh, we're a four to two or a four five. We're going to rally more like a five four. Um, but in a down, we have a we have very good protection. So, right, excellent. So I think we uh, it's we're almost out of time here, but I think we have uh, time for two questions. I think we can get through. Uh, let's go over this first one that came in, which says. Um, uh, I think you already answered this. I think you said two, but I'll, 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 I'll ask it anyways. How many Fed cuts do you expect this year? And then let me just add on here. How many Fed cuts do you expect next year as well? I uh, would expect three this year. I actually think June is more on the table than people think. Um, would expect maybe one the following year. 
maybe two. So our view, again, humble view here, I don't think you'll see Fed funds go below 4% in the next three years. And I think inflation will be between two and two and a half. And the proper spread over inflation, given the amount of treasury issuance, is probably about 200 basis points. So you'll be back to where you were from 1995 to 07, where Fed funds traded 100 to 250 uh, basis points over inflation, whereas from 09 to 21, you were 50 basis points through inflation or 100 over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At that point, you're gonna you're gonna want to uh, definitely find some attractive uh, levels there on the fixed income space. And finally, the last one, I'll throw you an easy one. Uh, okay. um, who who's gonna win the U.S. election in 2024? Oh <laughs> boy, yeah, that that's that's a tough one. Well, we were already wrong because we did not have President Biden running just for um, not being political either side, but just. You know, I don't think he's mentally there. Um, I, if I had to pick one or the other, I think Trump will win. You just have to pay attention to some of these lawsuits going on, which could be a snag. Um, and look, we're, we're a mess over here. I mean, I've never seen it as such a almost like poor options on either pick. Right. So, uh, you know, I, hopefully it, it, it ends up OK. But if I had to pick one, I would say it looks like I think Trump will win the um, the inflation side of the uh, the pain, you know, of the last three mm -hmm. years, I think will absolutely um, not allow the current administration to continue. Let's put it that way. Okay. Any sort of implications uh, from that result uh, for your portfolio, you think? Well, look, you know, both. Um, both parties like to spend money, right? I mean, we saw right. um, really, you know, Obama started spending money. President Trump spent a significant amount of money. Um, President Biden did, but then also President Biden spent probably more because of COVID. So, uh, you know, again, you would think someone has to, um, you know, start to address that. What, one thing I would say that's interesting, I think people forget, if you remember when President Trump was in office and all rates in Europe were anywhere from 50 basis points to 150, and we were like 2 to 3%, he was yelling basically at the Fed to cut rates. Don't you realize I, ha I have to issue a lot of debt? So um, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a um, supporter of lower rates, which would be stimulative, you would think. But uh, yeah, not, that's not the softball question, Ahmed. <laughs> well, I have to leave you with a memorable one. All right, okay. great. Well, Art, thank you so much for joining us today. Like I mentioned to everyone, Art De Gaetano, the CIO and founder of Brahms Hill, their income uh, a fund is uh, is a uh, is a core part of our uh, fixed income holdings over the IMAP side, um, and they are found within the investment guidebook as well. So, Art, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Pleasure to see you again. You as well. Okay. Right. Take, Take care. care. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Insignia Financial Group LLC comprises a number of operating businesses engaged in the offering of brokerage and advisory products and services in various jurisdictions, principally in Latin America. Brokerage products and services are offered through Insignia International Financial Services, LLC, headquartered in Puerto Rico, and through Insignia Securities, LLC, headquartered in Miami. Both are members of the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA, and Securities Investors Protection Corporation, CIPIC. Investment advisory products and services are offered through Insignia Advisory Services, LLC, an investment advisor registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. In Uruguay, advisory services are offered through Insignio International Asesores de Inversión Uruguay, SA, Insignio Asesores de Inversión Latam, SRL, and Insignio Asesores de Inversión de Uruguay, SRL, in Argentina, and through Insignio Argentina, SAU, and in Chile through Insignio Asesorías Financieras, SPA. Collectively, these eight operating businesses make up Insignio Financial Group. To learn more about the broker dealers, including their conflicts of interest and compensation practices, please go to https colon forward slash forward slash insignia.com forward slash disclosures forward slash or via www.finra.org. To learn about Insignia Advisory Services and any conflicts related to its advisory services, please see its form ADV and brochure 
which can be found at, in, at Investment Public Advisor Public Disclosures website, https colon forward slash forward slash advisorinfo.sec.gov forward slash.